Anna and I are going to speak from the from the podium floor. Okay. So you can either should we move your chair back here, or do you want to? Uh, <laughs> For you, James Andrew, kick off for this group. All right. I won't touch. All right.
Oh, good evening, everybody. Um, very happy to see so many of you here in person. It's great to have these events again in person after being off for a little bit. Um, so thanks very much for returning to campus this evening for the 43rd Vendlek Lecture. Uh, and a virtual welcome to uh, our guests joining us on Zoom tonight. So my name is Andrew Aline. Uh, I'm the Dean uh, of the College of Science and Engineering here at the University of Minnesota. I joined CSC this past January from the University of Illinois. So I'm in the middle of week 14. Um, at my former institution, I held a bunch of different positions um, as a faculty member, as administrator, um, and as a proud parent of a student there. Um, I spent the last several years leading an interdisciplinary center that was focused on enabling uh, electrified mobility of all modes of transport. Um, and there are a lot of exciting aspects uh, to this, but one of the most exciting was to see how science and engineering developed products that directly impacted the human condition. That was one of the things that we were most proud of. That ability to impact our world through some of these science um, uh, efforts uh, is really one of the key things I noticed about the University of Minnesota when I was considering relocating from the cold to the colder. Um, uh, it is colder here than in, in central Illinois, <clears throat> but I'm getting used to it. Just need the big coat. Um, so Minnesota, it is a world-class institution of learning. And I am really grateful to the uh, showing of warmth and welcome that I've gotten over the last 14 weeks uh, from the, the, the alumni, the, the staff, the students, and the faculty. It's all been uh, great uh, so far. But tonight, we like to celebrate the sciences and the detection of gravitational waves using quantum mechanics. To do this, I'd like to ask uh, Paul Crowell to come to the stage. He's the head of the School of Physics and Astronomy to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Professor Crowell has been a member of the faculty since 1997 and very grateful that he took over as head in 2019 because he successfully steered the department through incredible challenges associated with the pandemic and virtual learning and last fall's return to in-person classes and labs. It was not an easy task. And, and we're really, really grateful to Professor Kral for the, the efforts that he put in on behalf of all of us. But again, it's wonderful to uh, be able to safely return um, because of some of the precautions we've taken and how the world has changed. It's great to be able to safely return in person. Um, uh, both for the instruction that I talked about, as well as for events such as this uh, type of a public lecture. And so, Paul, could you come up and introduce our speaker? Okay. Thank you, uh, Dean Lane, and, and whoops. That's not, that's not, that was, uh, there we go. This implement, whatever it is. Uh, thank you, Dean Aline. Uh, I would also like to welcome all of you tonight. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people here in person um, and also to welcome our uh, audience online. This is the 43rd uh, annual Van Vleck Lecture. And before introducing tonight's speaker, I'll tell you a little bit about the origin of this lecture series and its uh, uh, significance for the for the School of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, John Van Vleck, uh, who was on the faculty at the University of Minnesota from 1923 to 1928, uh, received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1977, along with uh, his student, Philip Anderson, and uh, Sir Neville Mott. Uh, Van Vleck's five years at Minnesota were followed by another five years at our uh, neighbor to the east, uh, Wisconsin, where his father actually was a distinguished uh, professor of mathematics. And then uh, Van Vleck moved on to Harvard uh, around 1934, where he spent the rest of his career. Um, so about those five years in Minnesota in the 1920s, uh, Van Vleck was a freshly minted PhD from, from Harvard. Uh, and he was fully aware of the revolution in Europe that was going on in physics that was in the field of quantum mechanics. And in fact, in his first uh, couple of years at Minnesota, he wrote one of the first uh, theoretical papers on quantum mechanics by an American. It was very, you know, physics was uh, very much a European enterprise at that point. 
Uh, he then embarked on uh, two big projects, Minnesota, and the second of which, uh, which was eventually published after, well, papers were published in Minnesota and Wisconsin, but it became his, his book uh, in the 1930s on the theory of electric and magnetic susceptibilities. And this is what established his reputation as the father of modern magnetism based on, on quantum mechanical principles. Uh, he would then go on to found another uh, field of, of solid state physics, that's crystal, crystal field theory. Okay, so he was clearly a rising star when he was at Minnesota in the 1920s. Unfortunately, we've had several rising stars in the 20s and 30s who went on to other institutions, but, um, uh, and, and then won Nobel Prizes. But that fact alone is, is uh, not why we have a Van Vleck lecture series. Uh, for that, it certainly helped that he met his wife here. She was a student at the University of Minnesota, Abigail Pearson. And uh, they were married, I think, right before uh, they left for Wisconsin. Uh, and there the story stands for about 30 years or so. But in the late 1960s, a young historian of science at the University of Minnesota, uh, Roger Stewart, who is with us tonight by Zoom, uh, reached out to Van Vleck for comments on uh, some research he was doing on two other Minnesota physicists from the 1920s. Uh, one is uh, Joseph Valasek, and I invite you to come back in December of this year, uh, where we'll have a commemoration of Valasek's discovery of the phenomenon of ferroelectricity in 1921. And the other was John Tate, who is the namesake of the main physics building on, on the mall. So uh, Van Vleck, having been around during that period, was an obvious resource to, for, uh, for Roger, and they struck up a correspondence. And in fact, uh, Roger is the only uh, living Minnesota faculty member who wrote a paper with Van Vleck, although that turned out to be outside the mainstream of physics. It's on the origins of the Minnesota Rouser and uh, the uh, Wisconsin fight song on Wisconsin, of which apparently Van Vleck was uh, rather obsessed. Um, and you can look it up. It's in the Minnesota Alumni News from the 19, sometime in the middle of the 1970s. But returning to scholarship, um, Van Vleck, I'm sorry, Roger had, had suggested to his graduate student, Frederick Fellows, that he undertake research on Van Vleck's time at Minnesota in, in the 1920s. And uh, unfortunately, that project had to proceed without Van Vleck, who passed away in 1980 but uh, relied heavily on correspondence with Abigail Van Vleck. And it was during that period that she decided to endow this lecture series at Minnesota before she passed away in 1989. So the fact that we have historians of our discipline in physics, and this is one of the unique fact features of the College of Science and Engineering and that historians of the various disciplines are embedded in the relevant departments. So we have two historians of science in the School of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, this, this is one of our strengths. And if you're interested in learning more about that aspect of things, which as I said, is critical to why we have a Van Vleck lecture, uh, please come back tomorrow because at the beginning of the Van Vleck Colloquium in Tate, we'll have a brief ceremony honoring uh, Roger Stewart, who was the founder of the History of Science program at the university. And Roger has been kind enough to donate his really outstanding library on the history of physics to the School of Physics and Astronomy. So uh, with that, we now turn to tonight's speaker, uh, William Unruh. Uh, Professor Unruh was born in Winnipeg, Canada, several hundred miles north of here, and uh, received his PhD in 1971 under John Wheeler, who was the person who coined uh, the term black hole. Uh, Professor Unruh is well known for efforts to address the intersection of, of quantum mechanics and, and gravity. Tonight, you're gonna to learn about applications of quantum mechanics to the detection of gravity, where it's actually quite, quite important in the detectors. Uh, he's a professor who is most well-known probably for his uh, 1976 paper on black hole evaporation, which led to the coining of what is known as the Unruh effect. And if you wanna hear more about that, also come back tomorrow, because it's uh, the subject of his, his talk. And he's gone on to a long career exploring the foundations of uh, both gravity and, and quantum mechanics. He has received a long list of honors. Uh, you can read about these in, in the brochure in front of you. Among them, he's a fellow of the Royal Society of both Canada and the UK. 
and he's a former mem foreign member of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he has multiple appointments, including now at um, uh, uh, UBC and uh, Texas A&M and at the Perimeter Institute, uh, but his home institution is, is the University of British Columbia. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor William Munro, who will speak about quantum mechanics and the detection of gravitational waves. Thank you. Bill. Thank you. We have another electrical problem. Hello? You're right. There we go. Good. Everything working? Okay, so what I want to talk about is gravitational wave detection and quantum mechanics. I'm not going to be talking about quantum gravity. Um, the, the gravitational part of this is a highly, highly classical system. These gravity waves have an immense number of, if you will, gravitons in them. I think it's more than 10 to the 20th per cubic wavelength uh, of the radiation. So this is something that one would definitely call a classical gravitational wave. But we have to measure it with our instruments and all of our instruments that we're going to, what, that we use are quantum mechanical. And it turns out that the quantum mechanicals, quantum mechanics of those instruments are crucial to the operation of uh, LIGO. And uh, uh, at least if you don't do things properly, present one of the key limitations of our being able to detect gravitational waves. By the way, oh yes, I wanted to say that I'm also extremely happy that these lectures are dedicated to Roger Stewart. I've known him now for about 20 years. Uh, he's an amazing man, an absolute gentleman. Um, he was the editor of uh, Physics and Perspective. And from what I've heard from people, most of the papers that were published in there should have had his name as the co-author because he spent so much time and energy on every single paper, making sure that it was the best possible paper it could be. So I, it's been a real pleasure knowing Roger. Um, Einstein found his theory of gravity in 1915, having done a bunch of other work like special relativity in the earlier years. It's a very strange theory because what he says is that gravity is not some force as Newton had it, but is actually the inequitable flow, unequal flow of time from one place to the next. That if you look at one place and you look at time in another place, you find that the time is flowing at a different rate, comparing them to each other from one of those places to the other even though the distances between the two are exactly the same, this is not a velocity effect. Um, and gravity is not a force within this theory. Gravity is uh, simply, well, this inequitable flow and particles are trying to follow the shortest distance between two points uh, in this uh, geometry. Well, actually it's the longest distance between two points. Uh, because the Pythagorean theorem, when one includes time in the, in the equations, have a, has a weird minus sign in it. Um, but there was another uh, discovery, um, basically 1925, 10 years after Einstein's, which was quantum mechanics. And the two, two of the big names in that were uh, Niels Bohr, who in 1912 was trying to understand why in the world things like hydrogen, when you heat up hydrogen and so forth, it emits light in very, very particular frequencies, not generic frequencies. With the Rutherford model of the atom, you would have expected this atom to emit radiation because it's moving in orbits around the atom. But that gives, if you try and put that in, that gives completely the wrong answers. And then in 1925, Heisenberg was really a postdoctoral fellow of Niels Bohr in Copenhagen. And he came up with a theory, uh, which I will encapsulate very quickly, that 
instead of the attributes of the particle, like its position, its momentum, et cetera, momentum is just mass times the velocity, um, instead of them being thought of as numbers, they're actually these rather complicated objects called matrices, which in a sense include all possible values that that position and momentum could have at any particular time. Um, it's a theory which people still argue about nowadays, 100 years later. And these two theories have also been at loggerheads ever since. Nobody's ever managed to quantize gravity, etc. But that's a whole other talk. Mm. In 1916, he published his first paper, um, if, if gravity, as we usually experience, is uh, the inequitable flow of time from place to place, special relativity said that time and space are really very similar to each other, so one also should get the inequitable flow of place from time to time i.e. distances can change on their own, not because objects move, but simply because as this gravitational wave comes by, it doesn't exert any forces on the objects, it just changes the distances between those objects in and of itself. And he published the first theory, he got a few things wrong in that first paper and, and uh, Three years later, published another paper in which he got uh, basically how these gravity waves, gravitational waves, are produced by moving matter. Uh, he got it right, and the techniques he developed in those type papers are still very much the same techniques we use even nowadays. Um, now, the changes in distance, if one has a gravitational wave traveling by you, these changes of distance are perpendicular to the direction of the, of the travel of gravitational waves. So if there's a gravitational wave coming in from overhead, it changes distances laterally, both this direction and in this direction. And it balances them. If it increases that distance, it decreases this distance. So as the gravitational wave goes by, directed towards you, the distances between all objects in this room do this. They move back and forth like this, um, and so that such, such that the area stays the same, but the shape changes. Uh, on the next slide, I have a picture of what would happen to the Livingston gravitational wave detector. That's this Y formation uh, just outside of uh, New Orleans. Um, there's another one in Hanford and Washington. Um, and as the gravitational wave goes by, this is what it would do. So those lines that you see in there are the gravitational wave detector. And this is what the gravitational wave would do. Now, this is, in order for you to be able to see this, this is a factor of one followed by about uh, 20 zeros bigger than the actual gravitational waves coming by uh, produce. Um, these are four kilometer long uh, arms. In this particular case, these ends, the distances of these ends would move from the point of view of somebody sitting up here uh, by, uh, about 200 meters. In actual fact, they move by less than, um, what is it? 10 to the minus 20, i.e. a point one with 20 zeros following it and a one uh, of a meter instead of the distances that you're seeing here. How can we detect them? Since they're not that big, sometimes lasers don't work. They're not that big, how can we detect them? Well, one of the things is, you know that if you went ahead and took a, a lump of matter and squeezed it like this, it would object. It would try to straighten itself out. 
So as the gravity wave were, uh, went by, all the atoms in the uh, material would push themselves apart or in the opposite direction would pull the stuff back together. And as the, after the gravity wave went by, that had, would have started these objects moving and it would ring afterwards. And that was the first idea for building a gravitational wave detector back in the 1960s by Joe Weber. He thought he saw gravitational waves, um, very quickly became clear that he hadn't seen anything of the sort. It's not entirely clear what it was that he saw, but what he did do was make people realize that maybe it is possible to detect these things. Without him, I don't think people would have had the courage to see this, some would say, and not trying it and getting the kinds of sensitivities that he was getting, which were nowhere near enough to see gravitational waves, uh, but that, that they got that kind of sensitivity made other people try uh, to, do, to do better. So this is one way of changing things of measuring them the other way is to directly measure the distance between objects. And that was the idea that Ray Weiss at MIT uh, came up with and eventually is the one that we now use. For example, if we take light and we time it going from laser here off to this mirror and bouncing back, if we time how long does it take that wave to travel that distance, that will give us a feeling for how far away that mirror is. And if the distance of the mirror becomes bigger, then it's gonna take longer to get there. The problem of course, is we have no clocks capable of timing things to 10 to the minus 20 seconds. It's just completely impossible. Except light waves carry their own clocks inside them. The frequency of the light waves carries its own clock uh, inside them. And if you, care, if you uh, compare two of these clocks, one of them traveling, let's say up and, or that way and th back, this one traveling this way and this way, you can actually get those two, two to interfere, which is basically a measurement of how long it took for those two waves to travel along those paths. Especially as that one moves moves closer and this one moves farther away. So this one takes a little bit longer, it shifts the wave a tiny little bit and you can measure that tiny shift in the waves. Uh, so these waves, these light waves that are shone by let's say a laser uh, do this, they recombine, this is a half silvered mirror, so half of the wave goes through, the other half of the wave gets reflected, goes up to here, they recombine here, most of the wave gets reflected back out in this direction, and the way they design it is to let a tiny little bit of amount of this thing coming out here, and that tiny little bit will fluctuate in amplitude and tell you what the difference in distances is between those two guys. In LIGO, the intensity of this wave, well, at the time I wrote this was about 100 kilowatts. It's now up to about 400 kilowatts. There's 400 kilowatts of light inside these uh, two mirrors. Don't stand in there. You don't want to absorb it. That also illustrates one of the real difficulties you have because all of this 100 kilowatts is hitting these mirrors those mirrors better not absorb any of that light or they'll get heated up or burned up, which would not be good. Uh, so one has to make the most reflective mirrors that have ever been designed on the surface of the earth in order to set up this gravitational wave detector. Similarly here in this half silver mirror, it has to reflect or transmit all of the wave. None of it can be absorbed or else you've got troubles. There are millions of problems. Louisiana, uh, where, they, where, LIGO, uh, where one of the LIGO things was, they found this site which was seismically, not, seismically uh, quiet, et cetera. They built the gravity, uh, the arms of the gravity wave detector they got ready to switch it on, at which point the logging company who owned the land 
they only bought these narrow strips four kilometers long by about 100 meters wide. Uh, the logging company wanted those logs. Well, imagine what happens when you cut down a big tree and it goes, it shakes the ground. And these guys are so sensitive that they can see the waves hitting the beaches in the Gulf of Mexico. Or in Washington, the waves hitting the beaches in, uh, you know, out around Seattle and so forth. That jiggles the earth a tiny little bit, and that tiny little bit of jiggling is enough for these things to actually see it if you didn't try your damnedest to get rid of that. Um, trucks driving by on the highway. Not only do the trucks driving by on the highway shake the ground, their mass acts like a mass which attracts the mirrors and causes the mirrors to move. Even wind blowing over the top of the system produces these low pressure areas as you get these turbulent eddies. That's a little bit less gravitational attraction due to the air inside that turbulent eddy and therefore the mirrors move a little bit. All of these things are problems. But one of the most interesting problem is that light being a quantum object acts in sometimes as if it were made out of little bullets, or little photons. And the problem is that there are two problems that this causes. One is that when you detect the amplitude of the light coming out, you detect it in terms of counting the number of photons. And those counts of the photons jiggle around. It's called a Poisson distribution. Even if the light coming in is uniform intensity, uh, the number of photons corresponding to that jiggles around a little bit. It's called shot noise. And that's a quantum phenomenon. The other problem is that these photons hit the mirrors and jiggle the mirrors around. If it were a purely pure wave, they wouldn't. But because it's interacting with the matter there, in that interaction, it acts as though it's made out of photons, and those photons bounce off of the mirror and cause the mirrors to jiggle. The more intense you make the laser beam going into there, the more jiggling you get. Um, there are other problems, uh, for example, light scattering uh, from the air inside. Yes, that's a problem. So they have to make a vacuum that's something less than about a billionth of an atmosphere in this four kilometer long uh, meter and two meter wide tube that uh, they have. It's one of the best vacuums anywhere on Earth in a huge volume. This is one of the reasons why they have to, co they have to cover this whole detector in each of these places with huge concrete buildings. Why? Because people driving around with their guns in hunting season like to shoot at things. And here's a nice barn door, I mean, a side of a barn or something it looks like. And so they take pot shots at, at LIGO. You gotta make sure that none of those go through and damage the, the vacuum system or you're in real trouble. It's one of the most expensive parts of building LIGO is to protect it from hunters. <laughs> so this is sort of a sketch of the interferometer. Uh, there's about 20 watts, I think it's now up to about 50 watts of laser light coming in here. It goes through this, uh, there's a, a couple of mirrors in here. A little bit of it enters in here, builds up in this arm until you get uh, about 400 kilowatts of energy sitting inside here, which some of it goes out then and bounces off. And a tiny little bit is let out in this output port here. And that's what you measure and you look for changes in the intensity of it. This was one of, I mean, this is an absolutely astonishing technical tour de force. They have to try and stop 
noise, ground noise from getting through, especially on the frequencies you're interested in, to about um, one part in 10 to the 30th in energy, i.e. 300 decibels. Uh, your ear is sensitive from about zero decibels up to 120 decibels before you go deaf. This is decreasing the amount of the shaking of the ground by a factor of about 300 decibels, which is many, 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 many times more. Remember that one uh, 10 decibels means a factor of 10, 10 times louder. So this would be, you know, uh, 10 times itself, 20 times less loud once it gets to these mirrors than otherwise. Another tour de force was learning how to figure out what you're going to see. They knew there would be lots of noise. How do you see the signal in all that noise? Well, one a very important principle is that in order to find a needle in a say stack, you should know what the needle looks like. In order to see a gravity wave, you should know what kind of an effect the gravity wave will have on your uh, antenna. The problem was that since the 1980s, people have been trying numerically to solve Einstein's equations to figure out what kind of gravity waves, let's say two black holes orbiting each other, would produce. And every time they got somewhere, they didn't because they would run it for a little while and the whole code would crash. And it was only in, in uh, the early 20, 2000s when a student at University, uh, who had been a student, a student who had been one of my, uh, of someone who had been one of my students, Matt Choptuk was my student who was working on, uh, on numerical relativity. Franz Pretorius was Matt Choptuk's student. He got his first postdoc all alone. Most of the other numerical groups had lots of people working in them. He was all alone and was the first person to finally figure out how to figure out how many gravity waves were being given off by many, many orbits of, let's say, two black holes around each other. That breakthrough was an incredibly important breakthrough because it allowed people to figure out what to look for in the noisy signal to see whether they had seen gravity waves or not. This is an example of one from the, one of those calculations. These two black holes orbit each other. So these are the gravitational waves given off by these, while well, these two black holes are orbiting each other. In this case, this is down around 10 Hertz or so, uh, 10 times a second. As they orbit, they emit energy. And as they emit energy, they orbit more and more tightly around each other and go faster and faster. And so you get this very rapidly increasing chirp. It increases on a time scale of about a tenth of a second. Um, and finally, the two black holes run into each other and just leave behind one big black hole, which vibrates for a little while and then goes dead. So this is the kind of signal that they were looking for. This is the signal that they saw on in 2015, September 14th, 2015. This is what came out of the detector. There's no signal that you can see in there. This is all noise. So it's out of this noise that you have to dig it. Now this noise in particular, it's possible to get rid of a lot of it because if you look carefully at the scales here, this is two seconds here. This is a frequency of about 10 Hertz or something or one Hertz to 10 Hertz. You can filter that out. There's also little jiggles that you can't really see in here, which are up above 500 Hertz, 500 times a second. And uh, you can filter those out. And when you do that, at Hanford, they got this signal. And at Livingston, they got this signal. Now, there's obviously noise here. But this signal was so strong that you could just look at it. It's there. 
it looks very much like that graph that I had before. This is the slow um, oscillation. This time scale here is in tenths of a second or, or a twentieth of a second, 0 0.05 seconds. So that builds up, increases in amplitude, and then disappears when these two black holes uh, coalesce with each other. Notice that these two time scales are slightly displaced from each other by about uh, 70 milliseconds, uh, sorry, seven milliseconds, uh, which is due to the light, tra the gravity wave travel time between Livingston and Hanford. It came in from above at about 45 degrees and hit these two detectors. One of them had hit a slightly earlier, Livingston had hit light slightly earlier than it hit uh, Hanford. It actually came up from the center of, through the earth, traveling through the earth. The earth didn't even notice it and the earth didn't affect the gravity wave signal. It's not, the earth is completely transparent to gravity waves. So when God, this was a massive system, one of the massive systems that's been seen, there were two, two black holes of mass about 30, 30 times the mass of the sun. Their size would have been about the size of Minneapolis, uh, orbiting each other at the speed of light. So they're orbiting each other uh, something like 300 times a second uh, as they spiral into each other. They're about a billion light years away, so that's why they're so weak. The actual amount of energy produced by this is bigger than the light from all of the stars in the visible universe uh, during the time that this gravity wave signal was coming by. So it was an inten incredibly intense uh, source. It was so far away, however, that it gets diluted as it travels towards us and gives us the very weak signal uh, as, we, as it gets to us. And it only changes the shape of this interferometer by one part in about 10 to the 22. It came from the direction of the Large Magellanic Cloud, which sits right about here, but it didn't come from the Large Magellanic Cloud. The Mag Large Magellanic Cloud is very close to us. That's down in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, near the South Pole, uh, South Celestial Pole. Um, and uh, yeah. This is the second one that was seen on December 26th. This was God's Christmas present to physicists on Earth, our Boxing Day present. Class gravity wave detection, absolutely an astonishing technical achievement. But I said we wanted to talk about quantum mechanics. Heisenberg developed this theory in 1925. Why? To explain atoms. An atom in this you know, box about this big, there are about 10 to the 23rd, one followed by 23 zeros, atoms. Atoms are incredibly small things. They're incredibly mass, mass almost massless um, objects. And that's what quantum mechanics described. There have been debates <coughs> for the last hundred years as to whether or not quantum mechanics has anything to do with macroscopic objects like you and me. Does somehow the theory fail? It could after all. The difference between an atom and us is huge. Could it fail somewhere between us and atoms? And there have been very, very good physicists that have hypothesized that it would fail somehow, that we're classical, but somehow the atoms are behaving quantum mechanically. Anyway, one of the things that Heisenberg showed is that if you have some of the attributes, let's say of a particle, of an electron and a hydrogen atom or whatever, uh, that that, that it has attributes like its position and its momentum. Well, there was this, uncertain, this thing called the uncertainty principle that he proved mathematically with respect to his, 
his uh, mathematical framework and showed that if you try and measure one of them, you make the other one very uncertain. And he came up with this little model in order to try and convince people uh, that that would happen. He, in fact, intimated that this was the origin of the uncertainty principle, which when Bohr came back from his holidays, he was away when Heisenberg wrote this paper and sent it in. Bohr got the pay, his supervisor got this paper, read it, and was incredibly annoyed with, uh, with Heisenberg because he felt that, he, that Heisenberg had misrepresented it. Anyway, the Heisenberg microscope was, Heisenberg asked himself, if I've got a little particle like a, an electron and I want to figure out where it is, will I shine a light source at it? It has a wave, a certain wavelength. Uh, and that light source will scatter off this electron. I can now gather that light that's scattered off of this electron and focus it onto a screen. And I'm going to see some distribution of the light hitting the screen. And you get a, a, what's called a diffraction pattern because of the size of this lens on the screen. So you get an uncertainty here in how well you can measure where that electron is. But in order for the light rays to travel up there and back down or to travel straight through, they've got to bounce off of the electron. When they bounce off of the electron, they're going to transfer some momentum to it. And so the very process, if you try and measure this more accurately by making the lens bigger or farther away, then you get bigger angles for these bounces. And that's where the uncertainty principle comes from. Well, no, it's not where the uncertainty principle comes from, but it's consistent with the uncertainty principle. What he showed was that an actual attempt to measure something on an electron would give us uh, would obey the uncertainty principle uh, that he had dis discovered. So if I look at the uncertainty in the momentum, which goes this way, the uncertainty in the position, which goes this way, multiply them together, um, I get delta x, delta, or delta y, delta p is proportional to h bar. There should be a delta phi here. That's the angle, total angle here which was Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. What's this got to do with LIGO? Well, what are you trying to do in LIGO? You're trying to measure the position of these mirrors at the ends of the arms with light. It's basically exactly a Heisenberg microscope. But in this case, those two objects are 40 kilograms in size the weight of some of the people in the audience, not me. Uh, and, you know, this kind of size. They're as macroscopic as you could ever imagine. I mean, you could almost say that you're trying to measure up an elephant. So, the same principle that Heisenberg applied to this electron in the atom should also apply to the mirrors if the mirrors are also quantum objects. And why shouldn't they be? So in this case, what you get is, you know, just as in the electron, as you try to measure the position of the mirrors by light, that produces forces on the mirrors, uh, which makes subsequent measurements of position uncertain. Uh, and to accurately measure where they are, you get the same kind of diffraction uh, limitations as you do in the Heisenberg microscope. So this is LIGO, another picture of LIGO once again. Uh, all of this technology in here, this is one of the end mirrors. All of their, you're, you're suspending them on quartz fibers and steel wires that makes pendula and as you know, if you've got something that's a pendulum, if you hit it, the object at the bottom doesn't move very much. You know, the top can move, but the bottom doesn't move. Unless you happen to hit it at just the right frequency, the resonant frequency, and then the bottom can move a lot. Uh, 
The resonant frequencies in LIGO are down around three hertz. So you can't, you won't ever be able to use LIGO to see anything under than less than about three hertz. So one has these two sources of uncertainty. How can you reduce the shot noise, which is one of the uncertainties? Well, if you increase the power, of course, that has limitations. You make the power high enough, you'll melt the mirrors. Uh, but the other problem is that the more intense that beam is, the more the shot noise in that beam hitting the mirrors jiggles the mirrors. So as you decrease the shot noise, you increase the radiation pressure noise. And that's the balance that you always have. And the place where those two are approximately equal to each other has been called the standard quantum limit. Is there a way of getting around that? This is sort of the noise budget of LIGO. So we have here, this purple curve is the quantum noise budget. All of this is, is because of radiation pressure noise on the mirrors. It gets lower and lower as you go higher in frequency because of the masses of the mirrors. As you know, if you try to shake something very rapidly, it doesn't move very much. So if you're very well off the resonant frequency and you're trying to shake the mirrors with these bullets hitting the mirrors, these photons hitting the mirrors, it doesn't move very well as you go higher in frequency. Notice that below about 10 hertz, this brown curve is the uh, ground uh, uh, vibration, the seismic ice, uh, vibration, and it cuts everything off down around 10 hertz. So no matter how well you get rid of the quantum noise, you'll never get rid of this. But you notice after about 30 Hertz, it's disappeared. Their isolation is so good. Up at these high frequencies, the dominant frequency, the dominant noise is the shot noise in the readout. So one can balance these two guys against each other, but if you increase one, you decrease the other. Or if you, you know, increase this one, then that one you can decrease by increasing the laser frequency. So you can't really, you can win in certain frequency bands, but what's really nice about LIGO is it's a broadband detector. It can detect gravity waves of a whole bunch of frequencies, everywhere from about 30 Hertz up to about a thousand Hertz. Uh, these little blips, this for example, is supposed to be one of the violin string resonances in those supports. Those are two little supports, wires, under tension. And you know what happens when you have wires under tension. They vibrate. Like a violin, that's how a violin operates. Well, with those things vibrating and even thermal fluctuations will cause them to vibrate, you get some noise, but those are, are limited to only very, very narrow frequencies. So you can filter them out very exactly. So how can you reduce this noise? Well, these, you can decrease the noise in some regions and not in the other. But it turns out that there's a way of doing better. And that's called vacuum squeezing. Well, what's the vacuum? The vacuum is the state where you don't have anything, right? That's what you mean by the vacuum. You've gotten rid of everything. So how can you squeeze nothing? Well, quantum mechanically, one knows that the state of lowest energy, the state which has no particles in it, still has what are called vacuum fluctuations. If you try and measure the amplitude of the, the light of the electromagnetic wave in some region, you'll discover that it doesn't have a zero amplitude, but it's fluctuating back and forth. And if you measure it a quarter of a wavelength later, 
you'll find that as this one decreases, as if you can decrease this one, the next one, a quarter of a wavelength later increases and then decreases, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so these two noise sources come from two different places, but both of those places are coming in what's called the dark port, which is where the radiate, where the, where you read out the system. This one is typically set up so that nothing comes in, vacuum comes in. But let's say something came in, in this port. When it goes off the mirror, it goes in this direction and this direction with opposite signs. So this one comes through here, it goes in this direction and this direction with the same sign. In this one, they go on opposite signs. So if one takes the, uh, the, the uh, if you will, vacuum fluctuations, which are coming in here, which are exactly going up and down at exactly the same rate as, these, uh, as the waves in the laser beam are, then that alters the amplitude of those guys. That alteration in amplitude pushes on the mirror and causes it to uh, move. That's the, that's the origin of the uh, radiation pressure, which was realized by, uh, by Carl Caves, that it was the stuff coming into this so-called dark board that was causing both the radiation pressure noise on the mirrors and the shot noise. If you send in a wave here that's displaced by a quarter of a wavelength uh, uh, with respect to this wave here, then all that does is it shifts the phase. It, it, it makes this wave go a little bit earlier and this wave go a little bit later. That comes back when it recombines and produces amplitude fluctuations coming out of this port. And the shot noise, the uncertainty in the shot noise times the uncertainty in the radiation pressure noise behave exactly like X and P do, namely that's equal to H bar, this uh, uh, Planck's constant that determines the quantum mechanics. So the important thing here is that it's a stuff coming in through the dark port. There's stuff coming in through the laser port, but fortunately what happens to it is it goes down to the other end. It pushes on both mirrors in exactly the same way. So it affects them in exactly the same way. When it comes back, all of that stuff comes right back and goes this direction through the mirror, except for a very, very tiny fraction, which goes in this direction. The stuff, the radio, the vacuum fluctuations that come in here, on the other hand, go back out in this direction and either give you the shot noise or give you a differential radiation pressure on the mirrors. You know, if one of them is pushing the mirror in one direction, the other one is pushing the mirror in the opposite direction. Now, what is squeezing? You can take a laser beam and produce an amplifier which, uh, whose purpose is to make one of these phases bigger and the other phase smaller. This is called a phase sensitive amplifier. They're common devices. Doing it in light is more difficult. Uh, but if you feed vacuum into there, what comes out is noise. Because what's coming out is something which isn't the vacuum. And if it isn't the vacuum, then it must be something which has stuff in it. So you shine stuff in, which has got fluctuations in it, has noise in it. But if you choose it exactly correctly, you can decrease the noise coming out of the interferometer. It cancels out with the noise that naturally gets produced by the interferometer, by the shot noise and the radiation pressure noise. Now, as we showed you before, uh,
Whether or not shot noise or radiation pressure noise is most important depends on what frequency you're looking at. So you would have to squeeze the frequency of this light wave different ways at different frequencies. In one case, you want to decrease the shot noise. The other case, you want to decrease the radiation pressure noise. And what's astonishing is you can do that. I pointed this out back in 40 years ago now. And they're now doing it. This is a theoretical paper. So this is the effect of various possibilities on the, on the sensitivity of LIGO. The blue curve is sort of the current situation with no squeezing in it. This is radiation pressure noise. This is shot noise. You can increase the intensity of the light in the, in the, on the mirrors with the danger of melting the mirrors. This is increasing the intensity by a factor of about two. And here's the curve for that. Notice that we've decreased the shot noise, but increased the radiation pressure noise. And in particular, we haven't done, we've done a little bit of this at, at the narrow bit, at the, the smallest bit, but that's only over very small sections of the mirror. What happens if we squeeze it constantly so you, we don't care whether we're, we're just squeezing one of those phases uh, and forgetting about the other one? Notice that here we've squeezed it so hard that we've gotten, we've reduced the, the shot noise by a lot. But look what we've done to the radiation pressure noise. But what happens if we do this frequency dependent squeezing? That's this last green curve. We reduce the, the uh, total everywhere. In this case, one's reduced the total by a factor of about four. And if you've reduced the noise by a factor of about four, that means that you could see signals four times as far away. If you can see signals four times as far away, you can see more sources. In fact, the sources go as the volume, which now are 64 times as big a volume. That means the number of sources you're going to see has increased by a factor of 64. Right now, they're seeing about one source a week. At this point, you're getting down to one source an hour. So from being in a system, situation where one had never ever seen gravity wave signals. Six years later, we're in a situation where we have far too many of them. Who can analyze that many sources? How do you get enough graduate students working in the field in order to analyze all of those sources? And that's the situation where they're coming to now. This, of course, assumes that all of this works and we don't discover that quantum mechanics behaves somehow really weirdly in between, uh, which none of us believe was going to happen. So, in a but in addition to our understanding the universe much better and having this very, very unique way of looking at the universe. After all, gravity waves aren't really affected, except maybe bent a little bit, by any matter that they go through because they're so weak. They don't cause changes in the matter, and those changes in the matter don't produce gravity waves or measurable amounts of gravity waves. But this is also important for the foundations of quantum mechanics. For almost a hundred years, we've been debating whether or not quantum mechanics is true for everything, or is it just you know, a theory which is good in the very small and we have to forget about it in the very large, that somehow or other we operate on different rules than atoms operate on. Uh, and there have been a number of people, you know, people have been pushing these boundaries. For example, they've taken buckyballs has about 60 carbon atoms in them. 
and actually diffracted them and shown that you can get an interference pattern with these buckyballs. So buckyballs behave quantum mechanically, but a factor of 60 versus a factor of 10 to the 23rd, i.e., you know, a million, billion, billion, is a large difference. Uh, sorry about that. And there have been a number of very, very good physicists that have argued that perhaps quantum mechanics fails. Tony Leggett, I mean, a Nobel Prize winner in, in condensed matter physics, for a long time felt that somewhere, you know, not at the atomic scale, but at the intermediate scale, maybe micron scale or something like that, quantum mechanics must fail and there's something strange happens uh, in larger scales. Schrodinger, one of the other founders of quantum mechanics had different formalism, which turned out to be mathematically identical, uh, got very uncomfortable about quantum mechanics. Einstein never liked quantum mechanics. It's a probabilistic theory. And he said, you know, nature is, it's not, eh, it could be this, could be that. That's not physics. It is this or that or the other thing. And our physics should tell us that. And quantum mechanics doesn't. Schrodinger developed the, the whole theory and in his older years started getting very uncomfortable with it. And he had this great little model of what's been called Schrodinger's cat, where he said, imagine that you've got a cat, you stick it in a box, and uh, in the box, you've got a little radioactive source very, very weak. It emits one particle every, you know, 10 minutes. And you have a little detector over here, which is attached to a little lever, which allows a hammer to fall down and smash a bottle of cyanide. Now we wait, you know, 10 seconds or something. The probability that the atom has emitted an up a particle is 50-50, let's say. Well, that atom was a quantum mechanical object. And if we believe quantum mechanics all the way down or all the way up, then somehow or rather this cat should be in this funny state where it's in a quantum state of, of being alive and being dead, having been killed by the cyanide. And there should be experiments that one could in principle do, which would be sensitive to the fact that this cat is both alive and both dead, as, as it's usually phrased, is in this state where it has certain probability of being alive and a certain probability of being dead with a definite sign between them. And one should be able to do an experiment which would be sensitive to that difference. And he said, that's absurd. How in the world, you know, could this cat be either alive or dead? Surely it's either alive or it's dead. Now that experiment is incredibly a difficult experiment, not least because it has to take into account not just the atom, not just the cat, but the detector, the hammer, the cyanide bottle, the air in the room, all the bacteria which start chomping on the cat as soon as it gets dead, it would have to include all of those things in the experiment, which makes the experiment almost impossible to carry out. Except it's been carried out, not with cats, but with LIGO. Because what you have there is these mirrors. And if this cancellation of the noise is going to work, that mirror has to behave quantum mechanically. If you imagine that the mirror was acting like a as a, a classical system, and one tried to do the analysis, 
one would find that you could not cancel out all of these noise sources by squeezing the vacuum in just the right way. It's only if the mirror acts quantum mechanically that one can do so. Well, this mirror is much heavier than any cat I know. You know, 40 kilograms, that's a pretty big cat. Uh, a meter is a pretty big cat. We're starting to get into the bobcat uh, or tiger regime almost. Uh, and it will only work if that mirror is a quantum system. Now, of course, you could say, wait a minute. We're worried about that mirror moving by distances of 10 to the minus 20, one followed by 20 zeros, one over that of a meter. That's pretty minuscule. So there is still something minuscule about this mirror. It is big in size, in, in weight or mass, but we're only looking at tiny little motions. So you could say, well, it only applies, something has to be small. Well, it's certainly true that if we're going to be able to see it, once it starts getting big, then you start getting um, a, a phenomenon called decoherence. Other things in the world become correlated with it and that destroys the quantum nature of it. So yes, that would be a way out as, you know, out of the, if you really wanted to believe that quantum mechanics didn't apply to big things, you've got to say, well, it applies to big things, except something has to be small. By this point, you know, it's starting to sound like pretty special pleading. Uh, anyway, so LIGO gravity wave detectors are exciting objects, not just because of what they show about the universe in the large, not just because they can tell us how in the world these big black holes formed there, what their history might be, uh, what kinds of different scenarios might have created them, et cetera, but also because they're testing our theories of you know, quantum mechanics, one of the foundation theories of, of, uh, of the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, we have time for questions. And what I'll ask is that if you raise your hand, I can bring the microphone to you. And uh, for the online audience, please just put your questions in the chat and we have someone here to read them. So. Well, hello, everybody. I actually have a question um, regarding virtual particles. So obviously you created vacuum within the tubes for light to pass, but you could not have, uh, you know, somehow created something that would, you know, wouldn't allow virtual particles to enter there. So how would you account for something like virtual particles to not interfere with light or the mirrors and distort your um, calculations? Maybe if you could repeat that. I'm, my hearing has gone completely to hell in the last year. Uh, so the, the, uh, the question is, I, I believe, about virtual particles that are being created in the vacuum? Sorry. These, no, these are real particles. So, I mean, what are, I, hate the, I hate talking about virtual particles. Most <laughs> of the time, virtual particles are talking about you know, solutions of the field equations, which we're all familiar with, like the Coulomb solution, right? Or, mm -hmm. the, uh, or the Newtonian solution, the one over R potential, et cetera. And if you Fourier transform that in an appropriate way, you can say, well, this, you know, these Fourier transforms, I'm gonna call them particles. And so it looks like this Coulomb force is something like particles in it. 
and they're virtual particles. Well, they're not virtual particles, they're just Coulomb force. Uh, so in this case, fortunately, we're not worrying about any of those things. We're just looking at the free field that's propagating that doesn't have any of uh, any Coulomb sources in there for the electromagnetic field or whatever, except way, way back somewhere where these virtual particles can't get to uh, our system anyway. Um, sometimes people talk about these vacuum fluctuations themselves as being virtual particles. And at that point, I have no idea what they're talking about because you know the energy of the vacuum is the lowest possible energy that that system can have. A particle is something which carries energy. So if the vacuum has got these virtual particles, they have virtual energy. Why doesn't that virtual energy add on to the zero energy of the vacuum, et cetera? So I think the whole nomenclature, you know, the effect that they're trying to describe is a valid effect, but the whole nomenclature is almost specifically designed to make sure that graduate students get confused. <laughs> Other questions? Hi, I heard that gravitational astronomy sensors would be put into orbit. I think it's by the Europeans. How would that change the study of gravitational waves? So uh, you're talking about LISA, which is the uh, gravity wave detector in space? Yes. Yeah. So they're, they're planning on, on, on a, they've, they've done tests and the tests worked absolutely wonderfully. But these, uh, instead of these mirrors being four kilometers apart from each other, uh, there's something like, you know, more or less the Earth's orbital radius uh, apart from each other, flying in con a constellation uh, at the various Lagrange points of the Earth-Sun system. Uh, so it's a huge interferometer. Because they're so big, it takes light so long to travel those distances, they're completely insensitive to low frequencies. So the frequencies that they would be sensitive to are uh, millihertz or below, microhertz, in other words, a, thousand, a, 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 a frequency such that one cycle takes a thousand seconds or 10,000 or a million psych, uh, psych that's, that's where they would be sensitive, that would be sensitive to. I don't know what the latest uh, hope is of getting Lisa in orbit, but I'm afraid I'm not gonna see it in my lifetime. Uh, you might. Uh, so it's, it's an incredible, the big problem with working in space is you can't fix anything. You put something up there, it's put up there. You suddenly discover that there is one little screw that you forgot to tighten. It's untightened for the rest of its life. And if that affects the system, tough. You just got to scrap it all. And that's one of the really, really big problems. So you've got to make sure every single thing is going to work before you send it up there. Um, and that means a lot of money but be an incredible amount of effort on the part of the people building that to make sure it's going to work and that everything has been checked not once or twice. And we can see, you know, the effects of that, you know, the Hubble telescope, remember, they sent it up there and somebody happened to put a little shim the wrong way around into their optical testing table and the mirror had the wrong shape. Now, in that case, they were able to fudge things in such a way that they got almost as good a results as they would have had they done things properly, but they couldn't fix it. Well, they did send a crew up there. They didn't replace the mirror. In fact, yeah, it would have been far, far cheaper. They actually built two mirrors. The second mirror they tested, it was perfect. But NASA said, you're not allowed to send that second mirror up. Uh, you have to go up and fix it so that we can show that people can fix things in space. Well, with Lisa being a few hundred million miles away from Earth, you can't send anybody up there to fix anything. 
uh, you're stuck with what you have. It's going to be extremely exciting. It's going to see much, much lower frequencies than, than these Earth-based ones, which can't see anything below about uh, you know, 10 hertz, but are really good up to about a kilohertz. Uh, the space ones are down in the microhertz and lower kinds of regimes where you know it takes, well, as we know, the light comes from the sun to the earth, it takes eight minutes. So it takes something like that time scale for the light to go from one of the mirrors to the next one. So you're not going to be sensitive to anything with a frequency lower, uh, sorry, a frequency faster than eight seconds. Um, okay, we, I'm first going to take a question from online. Okay, yeah, we have a minutes, few questions. Sorry, so I'm going to read like a question from uh, Theodore. Uh, can you speak about the energy levels in the mirror coatings and how this quantum mechanical phenomenon impacts noise in gravity measurements? So, so the question yeah, is the one, one of the other, you know, one of the, another one of the noise sources is that both the mirror coatings and the mirror itself are hot. And so they've got thermal vibrations. The big advantage is that almost all of those thermal vibrations are at frequencies that are far, far higher than a kilohertz. You know, this is a mirror made out of silicon. It's very hard, uh, you know, and it's, it's only a few centimeters thick. So the, the frequency, the wavelength and the frequency of these oscillations is at very high frequencies where they're not going to bother you down at these low frequencies that you're looking at, uh, a kilohertz being a low frequency. Uh, so that's an advantage, but it is one of the noise sources. And if you look at the, uh, the more detailed pictures of the LIGO budget, it's sitting down there, but it's sitting down there about a factor of a, uh, what is it, 10,000 or something below the, uh, the problem the, the quantum mechanical problem. So again, even the quantum noise in those modes of vibration of the mirror are again down at these very, very high frequencies, are down, are up at these very high frequencies where they don't bother the detection as much as could be the problem. So there's, there's one other question in the chat from uh, Christina. What does your research say about the particle aspect of gravitational waves and how these interferometers could detect them? How could this affect any noise? So, I mean, one could imagine that one gets down to a, uh, a sensitivity for these interferometers that's, you know, 10 to the 20 times better than it is now or worse than that where one starts to become sensitive not to the average power in these waves in one wavelength, but to actual, you know, one starts to be able to see the individual shot noise of the of the of the uh, phonons themselves, of the gravitons themselves. That's so far beyond anyone's imagination, at least right now, that nobody knows how to do that. Certainly, you couldn't do it on Earth. There's no way in which you can suppress the seismic noise by another factor of ten to the twentieth. Uh, or any of, you know, almost any of the other possible noise sources, the little micro turbulences in the atmosphere that blow over the top of the thing. Uh, so the other thing is that people have done estimates uh, of what you would need. And at that point, you get to the point where you need things like you know, detectors that are of the mass of the universe of a size that's smaller than the, much smaller than the universe. So it's a black hole, you know. The quantum mechanic, quantum gravity then becomes an, 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 an imped, a real impediment to being able to measure them. And it's, you know, I will take Einstein's out, forget it, never gonna happen. And I could be equally wrong. <laughs> so back to space-based instruments. If you 
are then able to detect very, very low frequency phenomena, what dynamics would you expect to see? Well, for example, we know that there are there are, are black holes that are the size of the mass of galaxies, basically, you know, our, the center of our the center of our galaxy contains a huge black hole whose mass is a million solar masses. Uh, some of the other uh, galaxies contain black holes that are even larger than that. Uh, you could imagine that uh, in the more distant past, two galaxies collide and those two black holes orbited around each other and coalesce. So, and they would have time scales that are, you know, of the order of 10 to the six Hertz or something like that. So you could see things like that. Stars falling into black holes would produce uh, some gravity waves and you could hope to see those, uh, et cetera. Uh, and that's you would also start becoming sensitive to uh, the gravity waves that were produced by the Big Bang itself. You know, as the as as the universe expanded, it was extremely hot. So were the gravity waves that were produced. There are fluctuations in the uh, uh, in the density of the universe. Then those density fluctuations would themselves produce gravity waves, and they would then produce. Uh, gravity wave noise basically coming from all directions around us. You wouldn't be able to look at, you know, specific objects, but you would say, you know, we've done our damnedest. We're sure we understand our detector well enough that we understand all of the noise sources and there's just too much of it. Remember uh, Penzias and Wilson. They got the job, the echo satellites were sent up uh, to reflect radio signals back down to the earth in the 1950s. And they had these huge detectors to look up there and get the signals from, or send signals to these echo satellites. They were just big mylar balloons, huge mylar balloons. And they kept finding excess noise. And they went there and they got out their brushes and their soap and they scrubbed all the chicken shit and, and pigeon shit off of their things because they're hot and they will emit microwaves and still they couldn't get rid of this noise. It turned out coming from the Big Bang. So what you'd be doing is the same thing here. You'd make sure that you'd gotten rid of all of the chicken shit in your detector, in your LIGO detector. You'd done the best that you could and you couldn't get it any better and still you get too much noise from it. Well, that's probably now coming from out there and it's probably gravity waves coming back from all the way from back from the Big Bang. We'll have one more. So I would imagine there's uh, an immense amount of data coming out of LIGO. Um, I'm wondering, do they have real-time processing of this data that they can tell when, like almost immediately when these are detected or is a lot of this done in post-processing? Could you repeat that? I didn't quite get it. So the, the question really is about the timescale of the data analysis and whether if you're sitting there looking at the computer, can they see that, that the event has happened in real time or does it take lots of post-processing post well, hours? Of you know, as, as I showed you, what you see in real time is that incredibly noisy signal. So you've got to process that to remove the low frequencies, you remove the high frequencies, et cetera. Most of the signals that they've seen are small enough so that you, know, you had, let's see if this still works. You can see in this picture that yes, there, this green curve that you can just about see in there is the signal, the best match to the signal, but there's all this other junk. Well, for most of the sources that they found, this other junk dominates. So you then have to go ahead and do pattern matching. You, they have these databases of something like a million sort of, possible gravity wave signals, 
and they match those signals to these to the output of the uh, of the detector and suddenly say, okay, this one matches really well. You know, it's it's down in the noise, but because it's such a long signal, you get a lot of contribution from the gravity wave, whereas the noise tends to cancel out when you average out over a long time. And at that point, you can start saying, okay, this is maybe a gravity wave. And on this signal, they spent about five months because they were really, really, really worried that something had gone wrong, that this was a fake. Maybe some disgruntled graduate student got in there and fed a signal into the detector, uh, you know, into the computer uh, system to show these idiots what he could do. Uh, or, you know, maybe somebody crashed their car into the side of the detector. Well, that's hard to do for both detectors within a millisecond of each other. Uh, so they went through all of these possibilities and discounted all of those possibilities before they finally could say, for this, the biggest signal around, that they really had a signal. It's of course much more, it's uh, much more efficient now because now they're pretty damn sure that they do know that this thing can produce signals. The first one's always the hardest, but it still takes a while to analyze these things and to really be sure. The computer does it very fast. It sends out these little messages and says, look, I've got something that looks like it might be a gravity wave signal, okay? Then you have to take, you know, because there's, you know, they're, they're getting data every microsecond and so forth or less than that. It's a lot of data to look through. The computer has said, okay, here's an interesting place to look. They look there, they clean it up and they check that there's a coincidence between the two detectors or now there's three detect, well, there's more than that now. Uh, between all of the detectors that are operating now, is there a coincidence? Are they both seeing things? Is that coincidence reasonable for the light travel time between those various detectors, etc.? So it takes quite a while. I'm, I'm not sure what the fastest that they've done. Maybe someone in the audience knows uh, from the, the message the computer said, hey, look at this, to we got something, uh, but it's, it's certainly many days even now. This was one, you know, the filtering isn't hard. So this is one where if somebody had been watching it, they could actually have seen the signal coming out, you know, looking at that. They, <laughs> it was middle of the night in North America, I believe. And the first people who noticed something were the people in Europe. They got the message and they were actually awake. Uh, okay, I, I, if there are further questions, please uh, feel free to talk to Professor Nguyen when we're outside where there's some refreshments. And um, let's thank him again for a wonderful talk. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. All right, that was perfect. Uh. <laughs>